Is this working? <clears throat> Good evening. And welcome again to SciArc's Design Forum Lecture Series for the spring of 1987. It is a rare opportunity to introduce a person with so broad and profound a knowledge of the history and critical value of culture as tonight's speaker. Kurt Forster was born and educated in Switzerland. He studied in Germany, England, and Italy, and received his PhD in the history of art from Zurich University. He has taught at Yale, Berkeley, Stanford, and MIT. He has lectured widely in Europe and in the US, and also served as director of the Swiss Institute in Rome and of the Stanford Study Center in Berlin. Since 1984, he is director of the Getty Center for the History of Art and the Humanities in Santa Monica. He has written books on Mannerist painting and has published numerous articles in leading journals on the history of art and architecture. He has taken an increasingly active role in architectural criticism, and his essays and commentaries appear regularly in professional journals. He was an editor of the journal Oppositions for five years and is currently preparing articles on Giulio Romano, Renaissance patronage, and a study of Carl Schinkel. There are, regrettably, few persons commenting on our endeavor as architects who possess the sufficient historical depth and intuitive insight to disturb our preconceptions. Kurt Forster forces us to reformulate two flimsy theoretical foundations and two nearsighted historical views. His work is indispensable to us if we wish to create an architecture that is fundamental to the shaping of our culture. Please join me in welcoming Kurt Forrester. Kind of blinding light on one when one stands in front of you. You are so close to where I work that you don't know what you're up to now that I discovered where you are. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm always looking for a good uh, reason to escape uh, my own. Uh, by uh, totally absorbing, but also in large measure rather confining uh, situation. Uh, and uh, nothing delights me more, and nothing is more refreshing instead of lunch than to join other people worrying about their work. And of course, worried we are, all of us, whether we are in the studios or whether we are passing through the streets and looking at the work that has been done uh, by our contemporaries. In fact, some people feel that we have cause to be so worried uh, as Aldo Rossi that we have to say that now this is all lost, or Jesus is lange her. It's a long time since there was an architecture, and all that we are left with are the, is the debris. All that we're left with are the leftovers of an architecture that immediately begs all the questions, the largest questions that you've asked for the series about architecture in its place in landscape, architecture as landscape, to which I would like tonight to add a very peculiar intermediate category, and that is that of architecture as a stage. Architecture as a stage both for the conduct of life of our society, as well as architecture as a stage upon which what is exhibited in the first place is architecture itself. And then, of course, there are the far more specific and limited question. Is architecture indeed lost, the architecture that we have known, as Aldo Rossi seems to suggest? Is it reduced to either a ruin of its former self, or is it now uh, resurrected in the form of parasitic comments 
or parasitic structures which return like medieval hovels did to the chassis, to the underpinnings of the ruins of ancient Roman structures. Particularly with regard to Frank Gehry's work that is as familiar to you and probably even more familiar to some of you than it is to me, there is the question, does anything in architecture last? Should it be made to last? Uh, buildings, as we all know in our culture, may be physically sound, but fiscally unrewarding. And that may alone spell their fate. They may be firm in their structure, but flimsy in their concept and shabby in their physical execution. And that in turn may spell uh, the fate of the structure, either entire or of its appearance at any one moment. What does the architect do under such circumstances? What did, in fact, Gary do under these particular circumstances, which for anybody who has built in the state in particular, although Boston does not seem to be a singular repository of virtues missing elsewhere in the world, nonetheless, um, uh, uh, anybody having built in this state will realize that the question as to what you can hope or expect to see realized and executed is indeed a very pressing question uh, and one that inevitably is going to prejudice much of the quality of architecture to the extent that that quality depends upon a physical full realization in uh, actual terms of its execution. Is, uh, is construction then on the way to become an ephemeral event and product? And will it be such that only the architecture which makes that circumstance of the impermanence and ephemerality of construction a basic assumption or given in its own concept, will only that architecture be, as it were, true to its historical moment? Will only that architecture be able to answer some of the questions which inevitably beset and often um, uh, besought, in fact, architects who are after the creation of buildings that are expected to hold in them physically ideas that are beyond the possibilities of this moment to realize? We know, of course, since Vitruvius, that the durability, permanence uh, of building was considered a categorical requirement and one of the fundamental virtues of all construction. When, in fact, all the factors that we have enumerated and quite a number of others coming into play with extraordinary force today seem to suggest that this permanence expected of structure, that this lasting quality attributed to architecture may in fact be nothing more than a gigantic obstacle both to the continued social utility of buildings, the usefulness of the land and its, and its uh, uh, occupation, and in a sense perhaps even the possibility of defining ideas. Uh, defining ideas which, namely, in our time, may often be of a nature standing in stark conflict with the notion that their realization should then be uh, uh, lasting, permanent, or nearly so. When I turn to Frank Gehry, I would like to begin with uh, two perhaps rather marginal instances in his work in order to suggest an avenue which he seems to have explored with particular insistence, uh, an avenue that will perhaps allow us to propose some answers to these rather insistent questions. Among other things, Gary has designed work that from the start was expected to last only a season or even less than that. Uh, exhibition design is certainly a category uh, associated from the start with impermanence, with improvisation, and to some extent with uh, 
the possibility of uh, license that would be difficult to imply or demand for work of a more lasting kind. In the exhibition of Russian constructivist art held at the Los Angeles County Museum that has been the venue for a number of designs of exhibitions by Gary, uh, we can see in the two examples before you two aspects that illustrate very well, I think, not only an imaginative um, response to the peculiar circumstances of such exhibition design, especially here and for this kind of art, but a peculiar response to construction as such, uh, to the idea that indeed you will rig up a place for a particular occasion under special circumstances with highly calibrated, if impermanent, means uh, uh, to realize an idea more than to pour that idea into lasting concrete. On the right-hand side, uh, the display of Malevich's work uh, attempts generically to reconstruct an early exhibition in Moscow of Malevich's work and gives you, from the start, a very sharp sense of the impermanence uh, of the recall, of the kind of improvisational suggestion that has gone into setting up these uh, ubiquitous white neutral museum walls uh, in a museum space in such a fashion with the open upper sections revealing the studs the reaching the ceiling uh, with a clear sense of the suggestive and impermanent nature of the entire display. But perhaps more to the point is the example on the left, where a tiny model of Tatlin's tower dedicated to the Internationale, and of course never executed beyond a model size for parade in the streets of Moscow, is here illuminated in such a fashion as to cast a seemingly gigantic shadow, like a sort of a specter of history, onto the wall behind it, where we clearly assist in a sort of theatrical projection. We're looking at something which is from the start not assumed to have any physical permanence or any even physical presence of any uh, definite kind. In fact, the looming specter of this structure and in a sense the haunting image uh, that it has provided for much of 20th century construction, even construction looking totally different of course, such as uh, Sterling, uh, Foster and others, uh, that this haunting image of an architecture unrealized at its time and in a sense unrealizable perhaps in some of its ideological implications uh, is there put before us as if we were witnessing a, a, a theatrical uh, projection. This is more than making much better and imaginative use of a pitifully small and inadequate model of a great thought in construction, uh, it is clearly something which uh, in Gary's work reappears. Much of that work, in fact, is in a sense a continuous projection uh, where the physical reality of the building not only does not coincide with the reality of its ideas, but deliberately distances itself from those ideas to make perhaps even painfully clear a gap between what you see, touch, uh, and understand, and use, and visit, and what is implied in the concept of, this, of the structure. Uh, the Gary House in Santa Monica, of course, is a kind of incunabulum of this very concept. Uh, and it has more to do in uh, some ways with uh, the ideas that we will pursue than with a historic past, though it is surprising to what extent that historic past is neglected in any discussions of uh, Gary. I'm surprised to find in the exhibition catalog uh, to the show which started in uh, Minneapolis, which is currently on view in Houston, and with a typical LA delay is finally going to wind up at its point of origin in a year and a half or so, uh, that uh, there is virtually no significant comparative material discussed or reproduced. Uh, there is little more beyond 
purely generic statements that, of course, um, Gary was trained in this area, very nearby, uh, and uh, is a very observant uh, and responsive uh, uh, viewer of architecture in these uh, parts of the United States and, of course, also elsewhere. I would say that quite clearly Schindler provided with his work of the late 30s and 1940s uh, the most immediate starting point for Gary's work. And it is not at all surprising, as happens very often in history, that it isn't by any kind of passive sequence, by any kind of unintentional continuity that historical relationships are created. Um, but the precise historical relationship is created as an act, as an act of, of, of invention and of creation itself. So some um, nearly half a century after the work by Schindler is represented by the South Hall House on the right-hand side, uh, through Gary's response, an extremely isolated response at the time it is brought back. Now, just look at the way the entrance into the houses is uh, 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 shaped over these polygonally rotated planks, uh, the combination uh, that it has a kind of rawness about it between the large expanses of glass, then already cheaply available, large expanses of simply varnished industrial plywood, uh, the exposure of uh, uh, the uh, roof trusses above, and all of this, as it were, compressed, rigged up uh, in a very, very narrow space of the entrance, uh, provides us exactly with the elements that all are brought together in uh, 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 Gary's Owen House and in a number of other structures. Similarly, of course, the famous Van Decker House, the living room, 1940, by Schindler on the right-hand side, already makes use of that open uh, lattice cage, it makes use of a stark and almost disconcerting, almost surreally uh, ex uh, exaggerated contrast between materials uh, which are of the latest industrial production, like large sheets of, of glass uh, in contrast to the crafted uh, rubble stone walls. Uh, the use of a uh, kind of rotational impulse, as if volumes had been jilted, had been tilted into 60 four and 45 degree angles and so forth is, is, is present here as well as in, um, in, in Gary's own house. Uh, those rotations of volumes made, in a sense, the more dramatic for the fact that they're not opaque, as in the rotated prism over the kitchen on the right-hand side, quite clearly uh, illustrate the same historic connection, but are not to be treated, I think, as simply an influence or uh, some other such passive notion, as if the mere presence of something or the similarity of forms were to justify an elaborate theoretical construction that one is derived from the other. It is rather that in these houses, an element is realized in a very spontaneous and very poetically powerful fashion that was expressed by Esther McCoy in her characterization of Schindler's work, particularly since the late 1930s. It's worth quoting these lines because they could be applied with exactly the same justification to Gary's work as she applied them to Schindler, but not because of the specific formal affinities of the parts, but rather because of an informing spirit about the work. She said that these buildings of Schindler, and we would extend them to Gary's, were fragile. The fleeting, the impermanent, had a certain appeal for him. This was a kind of protest against the establishment, the finely built eclectic house, the nest culture, the building department, the closed concrete box. Now, for a, for a closely ranged series of enemies, that is uh, pretty good. Um, and uh, 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 Schindler certainly uh, took them on uh, in a real confrontation, and so, of course, as we know, the scary. But having said that he used his own house, in a sense, as a laboratory, as a, as a site of experimentation, or uh, to enter into the um, convenient industrial parlance as um, research and development uh, for future work for other clients, 
uh, is only uh, a rather anecdotal way of suggesting that indeed the house has been turned into an instrument towards the making the, of certain architectural stages, of certain internal and, and external uh, landscapes of construction uh, that have a great deal to tell us about the nature of architecture as it is now productively reflected and understood, as it is manifest in many, many details, mm, in details which in part have absolutely nothing to do with Schindler, but still enter into uh, this discourse as in the narrow stairwell that goes up between two of those volumetric units of the Gemini Press Building on Melrose Boulevard with that diagonal beam, an absolutely incongruous element that splices open and holds um, as if it were a wedge, uh, these two closed uh, volumes apart from each other. In other words, it is in a kind of in instantaneous, almost uh, crudely dramatic fashion that certain aspects of construction are deliberately exposed and used um, in order to uh, show that these are structures that have been rigged almost against rule and against the behavior of conventional materials and methods of construction in such a fashion as to give us that sense of construction being almost uh, of the nature that overcomes the physical forces at work in buildings themselves. Although there is a great deal, of course, of more elevated history for this. And that's another interesting lesson uh, for historians, uh, not only that they have to obviously uh, shout with the dogs, uh, bark up the wrong tree very often, but uh, that quite clearly uh, they are always tempted to reach for the most canonical material in order to create comparisons rather than uh, to a curiously indirect, incidental, and sometimes even entirely accidental way of uh, historic interaction between objects and minds. It's clear that, of course, the constructivist legacy, uh, the extraordinary uh, unresolved uh, and uh, clearly uh, uh, still vital uh, tradition uh, of um, a Melnikov, uh, of Tatlin uh, and others uh, that came back to the surface, particularly in English designs of the late 50s and early 60s, as in Sterling's Leicester Engineering Building of 1959, 1963 on the right-hand side, um, made allusion quite explicitly uh, to similar constructivist devices as the glass cube does seemingly crashing over the kitchen uh, of the Gary house. The connections which exist in constructivist work, the closest connection, think of a Rodjenko or a Malevich between pictorial, sculptural, and architectural uh, thinking and exploration comes back with the same force and with the same uh, uh, specific terms in such work as the very, very early house by Gary for Ron Davis, the studio of 1972 in Malibu, uh, shown in its uh, interior after some internal evolution on the left and in an axonometric uh, uh, drawing on the right-hand side, which go to show together as a kind of internal landscape between stereometric shapes under a unifying roof, which was really the only unifying element, was being created very much as if you were taking axonometrics seriously uh, as a physical reality and tried to cast the work of Ron Davis as much in a three-dimensional mode as was possible. But again, we can descend much further and we don't have to rest with the rather convenient case of an artist asking an architect to do a studio for him and of course the almost uh, 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 naturally expected connection between the artist's work and the, art and the, the uh, architect's affinity for that work to determine the outcome. But we could point to similar constructions which are peculiar in fact to California in the late 40s and uh, 50s that drew a number of people here and that gave rise to work which only rather recently has been recognized in its peculiar qualities, such as this folding chair by Schindler of 1950, 
in which, uh, you know, like those extraordinary ironing boards that you fight with after both of your thumbs have been caught between moving metal parts, um, so that, uh, that the, the uh, pain of, ho of, of housework and the uh, kind of uh, rather unrewarding conditions under which it is uh, executed for everybody's benefit are dramatically driven home to anybody touching the ironing board. At any rate, this sort of chair, which can be folded up like an ironing board, and which is based upon the intersection of planes and hinged um, uh, um, uh, folding of, uh, of, of planes in order to make uh, stereometric shapes that, in a sense, can be folded back up into flat planes uh, is the, the very means, the very concept behind the chair. Similarly, of course, Gary uh, toyed with the very same uh, means. And in the corner solution of his house, in a sense, he threw together, perhaps almost in exasperation, the extraordinary planar traditions of cutting and moving planes in, s in different depths and layer and identified with specific different materials and the starkly volumetric nature of seemingly transparent prisms of glass uh, that seem to be cutting through space in, in such a dramatic fashion that one uh, immediately uh, marvels at uh, the skill that is required you know, to cut the wood and to crimp the metal at the corner and so forth. And you look very closely, that skill itself comes a little bit in doubt. But <laughs> when you extend these elements from one single house, and here we really enter into an important uh, further public dimension of the work, they extend them beyond the house and uh, include a number of different structures and finally extend that to the an entire site with all its manifold relationships to the surrounding areas, then you have probably one of the early and particularly persuasive examples, 1981, in the very nearby uh, Indiana Avenue uh, houses. Unfortunately, I can't show you exactly the photograph that I would have had to go back to take, um, uh, but um, you can yourself verify what I'm going to say in a moment uh, by simply driving towards um, these buildings and to recognize them in their extraordinary role within that part of Venice. Now, the ephemeral nature of construction, which we said had so many different causes, unrelated immediately among themselves, but bundling together to become an almost inescapable set of conditions under which work has to be done, of course, range from uh, and are encouraged by the particular climatic conditions of California. I mean, some people have shuddered at the thought that some of these buildings might be constructed in other parts of the country. Um, and quite literally, I mean, already freezing by looking at them, you know, like you see somebody coming out of a shower in the cold. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that at this particular stage in the history of building materials, um, uh, the, we, we have to look for solutions. We have to experiment with means uh, that uh, uh, continually propose, uh, me, uh, propose avenues to us that have not been previously explored at all uh, uh, in, in two rather contradictory ways. One is that, of course, many of these materials can abbreviate um, uh, earlier construction processes, can substitute for complicated and expensive materials. And at the same time, of course, they can also in many ways block um, work. They can uh, prevent or inhibit work that would otherwise be done if they were not available and had not all the economic uh, r uh, advantages to recommend them. Then, of course, uh, not to forget financing, not to forget uh, the relationship between the initial in investment in the structure, or how that translates into a bank uh, determination of the value, the mortgage, uh, uh, the, uh, and so forth. And then, of course, also in a rather more persuasive and broader philosophic sense, the circumstances peculiar to our existence, not only our local existence, but our own historic moment, um, uh, surely uh, uh, weigh very heavily 
in these particular uh, definitions. Now, this ephemerality of construction uh, has been a extraordinarily uh, persuasive theme in Gary's work. It does show itself in any number of different uh, uh, respects, yeah. and not only in the most obvious ones. It has manifested itself, among other things, in his delight in exposing various stages in the construction that usually are rather quickly replaced or supplanted by other later stages. So that, in fact, in a certain sense, you can look at the three units of Indiana uh, Avenue uh, as being each one a kind of usually momentary stage or uh, transitory stage in the history of a construction. Also, in a larger sense, in the history of construction. And on the right-hand side, in the interior, uh, a particularly dramatic contrast is made between the elaborate truss work that, at least in this country, still seems to be cheaper to, to produce in, with wood trusses than uh, any other way, uh, visible on the inside as an extraordinarily overscaled element of construction, whereas on the, right, on the left hand slide and from the outside, you see it simply as an, a very dumb form of large stereometry, which explains absolutely nothing about itself. It could be made seemingly from the cardboard in which refrigerators are developed, uh, delivered, or it could be uh, something stamped out of, uh, or cast in fiberglass, whereas on the inside, it really shows it's almost painfully overwrought um, physical support structure next to the pure accident of the taped and spackled cheat rock wall. That is clearly one moment which in the history of construction usually lasts as long as it takes it to dry. And then it is immediately covered over, of course, with a decent coat of paint. Um, whereas here, decency is, as so often in Gary's work, cast to the wind or whoever stands nearby. And, <laughs> and what is exposed is, is really a kind of um, a state of uh, permanent undress. Uh, uh, so what is here made visible for quite a while, and perhaps was made visible for the length, potentially, of uh, the occupancy of such a structure, is a moment in its history that is completely unintended and, and unfit, one would have thought before, to be fixed uh, and to be made and kept visible. That is a kind of almost archaeology of precisely this process where one passing moment follows the other according to the contractor's and the subcontractor's ability to, to um, uh, uh, coordinate their schedules. Um, but here, uh, an ornament is uh, recognized that is totally unintended. It's an ornament which not even the people who created it had any intention of making. It's determined in its making entirely by uh, a, a, a routine method of, um, of course, taping and spackling the, the nail head depressions which are in the sheet rock. Uh, but Gary was not the only one, is not the only one, to have, of course, discovered a kind of completely unintentional poetry, a sort of stochastic uh, or d decoration in these elements. There is Joe Deal, the uh, California photographer, uh, commissioned by MOCA to document the history of its construction. I'm sure they didn't pay him for this, but he photographed uh, as many walls freshly taped and spackled as he photographed finished uh, stone-dressed walls of the museum, uh, obviously responding, uh, perhaps spontaneously, in a, in, a, in a very interesting fashion to the same uh, po poetic potential, so to speak. Now. The unfinish of the work, let me go back for one moment, the kind of fragmentary nature of every part, the incomplete or impromptu aspect of the entire setting, and the curious contrast to the surroundings within which these three blocks appear either as um, the, rem the remnants, the sort of ruins of a totally different settlement pattern in that part of Venice, or perhaps as the harbinger 
of a different one, surrounded as they are by rather decrepit um, you know, little bungalows and open lots and a few rather humdrum intrusions of more recent date. So that, in a sense, these three play both ruin and future uh, to their surroundings. And they remind us of something else, which we very often forget. And that is in our textbooks, we think of uh, places like Baroque Rome as essentially finished, as complete and coherent, as if they had been cast from one admittedly gigantic but nonetheless intact mold, uh, as if somehow uh, the fragmentary, the incomplete, were only something invented to terrorize Leon Creer, who would like to put an end to it at once. Um, uh, who is in fact acting, trying to ratify a fundamentally mistaken historical knowledge, namely that all those European cities, which somehow wound up to be rather filled up by 1900, were at, at any one moment in their history anything like that. So when you were in Rome in 69, and perhaps you were not a Roman, but you came from the north. And you looked at some of those quarters which we know as now rather monumental, coherent uh, areas uh, where palace after palace lines the uh, straight uh, streets and avenues. And you came to Rome at that time, what you saw was a picture like the one on the right-hand side, where indeed the newest construction seemed to resemble more the, more the oldest ruins in their role within the cityscape than to put before you a closed, finished, coherent uh, impression of a new age. Here is another glance, and the closer you get, in a sense, the more interesting it becomes, of the um, uh, sheetrock patterns uh, at Indiana Avenue on the left. And, of course, this is a way to remind us of Gary's systematic employment and extraordinarily imaginative deployment of materials that seemingly were previously completely reduced to their base immediate functional uh, uh, rationale, like fencing materials, etc., uh, or the construction of a platform, presumably in order to have a speaker uh, stand on it. Uh, but here in the stage set for available light, the opening performance at MOCA in 1983, are combined in order to create extraordinary uh, volumetric uh, definitions of an inside space that it would be virtually impossible to accomplish by any other means except those familiar from uh, uh, stagecraft, those familiar from the use of gauze curtains in theater, uh, the use of uh, light, the, the, the use of uh, uh, various different semi-diaphanous and diaphanous layers in order to give a particular atmospheric quality to a stage. Now these atmospheric qualities, seemingly determined by the meshwork that screens and filters modulates your view and your apperception of spaces, is something that Gary has employed to such a degree that, uh, in fact, an entire new category uh, has to be established in order to define that work in its significance for architecture on a larger scale. And I'll try to do that in a moment. But I would, I would first want you to recognize to what extent, indeed, this comparison to theatrical work has a basis in fact, to what extent, indeed, we must, in some projects, particularly of the early 1980s, think of Gary's architecture more specifically as that of making a stage at the scale of built architecture and the sale scale of the cityscape, uh, rather than think of these means only as, as inflections and modulations of the general conditions. Of course, for that, we can turn to one example, best of all, unfortunately, very poorly reproduced here, but since it's, it's uh, in our own city, we can uh, uh, readily verify any of these things. We are, of course, looking at the Loyola Law School uh, campus. Mm, uh, and uh, uh, in the plan, in particular, notice how, in a relatively restricted area, a number of administration buildings, classrooms, a chapel, 
a courthouse structure uh, are all grouped together as if to form a kind of stage set for something like a play of, of our about our town. You know, something that quite clearly charges now architecture with a role uh, that otherwise seem hardly to lie in one hand uh, of a designer and hardly seems to be brought about in this fashion at once. If you just look at the way uh, individual building components and even freestanding structures are arranged, you must, of course, think back again to the same connections that we have suggested before, just such as on the right-hand side with Sterling's unexecuted project for the North Rhine-Westphalian Museum in Dusseldorf of 1975, where in the immediate foreground, there's a kind of lonely, gary building that's trying to hold its ground against, uh, against uh, uh, the design that uh, Sterling will drive to far greater uh, cohesiveness in the similar project for the then executed Stuttgart Museum, uh, which you will see in a moment. The external views make this very clear. The treatment of the ground, the grading, the use of uh, starkly differentiated paving materials ranging from grass to asphalt, uh, the uh, highly fragmentary characterization of buildings that seem to lend, as it were, only one or two of their most um, uh, familiar, almost archetypal features uh, to this narrow space, and then are a often in an extraordinarily detached way analytically presented rather than anecdotally. Uh, it isn't that uh, a quaint little Charlie Moore chapel is being put on which will soothe everybody into the belief that there are still lots of people going to church. Um, but uh, here, a kind of uh, cross-section which starkly exposes the scheme rather than suggests the quaint appearance of the belfry and the chapel uh, are being put side by side. As if for this didactic demonstration, you needed as much a cross-section of such curious and antiquated buildings as you needed their full physical and immediate presence. So that in this way, what might in very superficial terms occasionally have something in common with, uh, let's say, an architecture of Charles Moore, is in fact, couldn't be more starkly different, couldn't be almost more polemically set aside uh, against it. If Charles Moore, in the publication that you all know about body memory architecture, uh, makes these facile comparisons between uh, an otherwise harmless, if somewhat uh, uh, incoherent house in Santa Monica Canyon, the Burns House on the right-hand side, and um, a, a whole uh, selection of great shots from Bavarian Rococo churches, such as the Wies Church by Zimmermann, um, in, a, in a fashion which not only invites but outright insists on an immediate comparison between the two and most of all the kind of culture shopper's delight in having brought home from faraway lands some qualities which can now be at will invested at the rim of the pool or in the stairwell of your own, own house uh, quite clearly brings out this belief that the qualities of buildings are almost like decals can be peeled off when you like them and stick them on where you need them. Um, this, this operation, um, which is very consistent and indeed is brought out in the vocabulary, I invite you to read some of these texts and you wouldn't believe your eyes, um, uh, where, where in fact, you know, the Parthenon Charter uh, uh, and, and a few great Baroque churches uh, are at your fingertips no farther than Fat Swaller, you know, had the keyboard from his. And immediately, immediately, of course, he tinkles. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 t the tinkling is so ostentatious as if you heard Debussy play two octaves higher as uh, so some sort of uh, Amtrak on a madcap course where passing your architectural education in the background. This sort of operation, <laughs> this sort of operation uh, is, is, the, uh, is the destruction of any kind of, of qualities that can be claimed to 
uh, to um, be part of the architecture of the past that's invoked. And of course, we know what it does to the architecture done at the present. Um, therefore, there is, there is no such connection between the reductive, analytic um, uh, presentation of buildings and their typological origins and component parts and this uh, uh, highly ideological application of uh, uh, cultural um, collections uh, to the making of, of new buildings. It is probably not accidental that in the Burns House, of course, it is a, a, a grotesquely overscaled organ uh, that is in there as the shrine inside this building. Now, when you look to the Loyola Law School plan, and particularly to one uh, or the other of its most uh, striking features, such as the stairs and ramps uh, that uh, seem to break across the otherwise uh, simple uh, uh, volumetric um, uh, shapes of the individual buildings uh, that we recognize in there a kind of almost optical distortion which seems to be the result of projecting into three dimensions back some of the elements that you have encountered in the Ron Davis uh, studio house that have to do with a curious recognition that a stair for instance as it narrows while ascending is giving an extraordinary dramatic uh, uh, impetus to this ascent and uh, uh, this is the sort of treatment of familiar shapes and familiar components of buildings uh, which is familiar far earlier on from stage design. On stage, you usually have a little depth only. You have very narrow and con uh, confining dimensions which uh, require that um, any element of dramatic significance be given a kind of... Uh, uh, excessive uh, dis uh, distortion, a sort of um, uh, dramatic exaggeration of perspective and foreshortening. And it is indeed, I propose to you, uh, in the design of stage sets that we find the means already, as it were, fully present in the very early 20th century and widely practiced uh, uh, for this sort of treatment, particularly when, as in the case of the law school, the entire setting is indeed stage-like, as I will propose a little bit more fully in a moment. On the right-hand side, you look at uh, Adolf Appia at a, at a re redrawing of Adolf Appia's uh, plans uh, for uh, tr a Tristan production in Milan in 1923 at the Scala, conducted by um, Toscanini, in which these uh, sharply uh, changing directions of stairs an exaggeration uh, of a few components like a gate, platform, ramp, stairs, etc., uh, are all brought together in the sketch of the view uh, onto the stage on top, and most of all, critically visible in the ground plan, as a set of heavily distorted individual shapes, which in overall impression for the onlooker create simply nothing more than a particularly powerful volumetric presence of these parts. Indeed, I propose to you that the Loyola Law School is a kind of stage set in quite a literal sense. That is to say, uh, Gary sets a stage for, with these distinctive volumes, he stakes out a kind of public sphere with a model-like and therefore programmatically reduced array of different institutional buildings and sites. Instead of indulging in what almost everybody else would have been tempted to do, namely to stick capitals onto the columns, to provide, for God's sake, the details of these buildings, to put in cornices and, and uh, serliane uh, and, and everything else, uh, to, to, pla to put the, the lamps behind wet-shaped sconces and so forth that all of these elements which he so studiously denies bringing in, of course, in their absence and in the degree of abstraction in the structure, serve basically one purpose, and that is that they create 
a setting within which not only the students are unfinished, these people are training, they are learning to become lawyers. They don't know yet how to behave inside this court. Um, uh, and now they don't have to do it in the presence of an overwhelming quasi-Grecian you know, federal courthouse. But they do it in, an, in a dramatically unfinished setting in which everything, as it is, were only a sketch. It's a kind of world in which enough of the clues are offered without the game itself being already rigged. I would make the comparison between buildings that try to be the story and buildings that are trying to be the stage. These buildings are trying to be the stage only and to not only allow but literally demand the story to be enacted by the actors, by those who are present, those who through their own behavior uh, in the process of training, as it were, are going to fill out the blanks, are going to uh, render specific what is by definition necessarily um, only generic in this instance. Of course, uh, again, uh, the connections can be made very directly to a number of aspects, particularly those less frequently photographed and less uh, glossily published now, of such buildings as Sterling's uh, Stuttgart Museum, where, however, another interesting distinction emerges, and that is that Sterling's basic shapes are crisp, finite, and of a clear historic flavor, whereas Gary's are equally crisp, but non-finished, and therefore of a curiously historical mobility or unspecificity, whereas the presence of all the uh, typical industrial materials, the stairs, the railings, uh, the, the lamps, the, the glazed walls, etc., are all integral in Gary's work to this stage set, whereas they become a sort of gargoyle on Sterling's buildings. Mm, they are constructivist uh, finials and, uh, and uh, uh, additions, accretions, which are worn by the building, which otherwise could in its basic massing, in its extraordinary cornices, in its basic plan, not be further removed from the world of that polychrome poetry of industrial materials and contemporary shapes. By comparison, then, we find the return to that seemingly common and dear source of constructivism, dear and common to Sterling and Gary in many ways, to yield a very different uh, result in Gary's work, particularly in such exhibition designs as the one of 1980, which you see before you, for the constructivist uh, show in Los Angeles. And applied and extended further and in a very extraordinary way pushed deliberately towards theater more and more in 1983 in the German Expressionist Sculpture Exhibition, likewise at LACMA, in 1983 on the right-hand side, where the individual pieces of sculpture are set in specially lit uh, boxes like model stages and one's approach to them, passage toward and the respect for an aesthetic distance is, uh, are, are all realized by means of uh, the employment of different materials, how a, a short stretch of parquet flooring is able to create almost an orchestra pit-like distance between uh, these individual sculptures in their box and the viewer placed outside. Therefore brought vis-a-vis -vis the sculpture clearly into the rapport of an audience, an audience that potentially either by close physical connection or by uh, a disposition and study of the work from that point of view is drawn almost imperceptibly into the stage itself and becomes a part of that setting, the sort of experience deliberately calibrated and employed with extraordinary virtuosity by such performance artists as Laurie Anderson, as here in a still shot from the later stages of her cycle on the, on the United States, this one of uh, 1983, where three musicians, their projection 
uh, onto as uh, shadows, and they're, con they're contrasting differing use, both as foreground and background figures, on carefully uh, calibrated layers of depth on the stage is indeed very closely related in its intentions and in its means to the sort deliberately calibrated and employed with extraordinary virtuosity by such performance artists as Laurie Anderson, as here in a still shot from the later stages of her cycle on the, on the United States, this one of uh, 1983, where three musicians, their projection uh, onto as shadows, and their, con their contrasting differing use, both as foreground and background figures, on carefully uh, calibrated layers of depth on the stage is indeed very closely related in its intentions and in its means to the sort of stage that Gary tried to create for those sculptures of uh, German uh, expressionist artists. In fact, I would like to tighten this connection a little bit, uh, not least because it, I think, will help to understand certain aspects of Gary's work far more explicitly, particularly when you uh, take some of the very stagey, extraordinarily um, impromptu constructions uh, like his contribution to that infamous Strada Novissima of Portugueses in the Venice Arsenal of 1980 on the left-hand side uh, and hold it next to work predating by years uh, that uh, uh, cage work of uh, uh, studs on the left, namely uh, Robert Wilson's Einstein on the Beach in the production of 1976 on the right-hand side. Uh, just uh, compare the use of uh, a foreground screen and uh, starkly lit distant shapes um, uh, in uh, Wilson's work with the similar combination, the use of that window as a distant vanishing point and the use of uh, both vertical screens and seemingly perspectival recession um, indicated by what one would otherwise suspect to be merely diagonal slats in order to um, uh, strengthen the rigidity of the cages uh, of two by fours that you see on the left hand side. Uh, in order to understand to what extent indeed this architecture even in its most elementary means is already playing as heavily on its optical uh, qualities on its stage set like um, dimensions as it is uh, invoking architectural structural concepts uh, by themselves. Of course there are as many other options that Gary has explored, and they relate to theater of a different tradition, theater of a different kind, a theater which, as it were, is uh, uh, staged in stark light um, and is most of all based upon the isolated platform and the clearly circumscribed recess, alcove or nook. And in the right, on the right-hand side, the 17 artists in the 60s at LACMA of 1981 tried to do exactly that, namely give to every single group of works and sometimes to individual works a niche of their own, differentiated by color, by floor um, treatment, by lighting from the next, as if indeed you were walking through a whole series of different model stages uh, each one fit for a particular type of work, or on the left-hand side, of course, the early exhibition at the Temporary Contemporary, where it's the elevated platform upon which you walk as a visitor, like to an excavation, and uh, as if you were partly on the outside of buildings that have balconies that allow you to look down into lower areas to re-gauge uh, your rapport to other parts of the space, and therefore the works of art are exposed in an almost extreme fashion and put on the same footing as the viewer to the exhibition. These two ideas, namely the container adequate uh, for individual groups of works that are therefore shielded from any other context and the parkour or passage through these as a kind of um, architectural uh, architectural armature through these different isolated spaces are brilliantly realized, of course, in the aerospace 
museum, where indeed on the outside, again taking up very deliberately constructivist traditions, these individual volumetric exhibition halls are shown for all they can be and are, and are uh, uh, manifestations of essentially an architecture of interior spaces that produces a sort of broad shouldered costume uh, over these shapes to the outside, uh, uh, as opposed to uh, the inside spaces, perhaps comparable to, again, uh, the uh, enormously influential and very closely known uh, Leicester Engineering Building of Stirling, where the same constructivist sources are tapped and where a similar exhibition is made of the different internal uses and functions of spaces. Now, this is no longer anything resembling a kind of flat-footed functionalism. This is, in fact, a dramatic staging of uh, uh, the consequences of an interior organization that, to the outside, then, has only one m m means left of manifesting itself, and that is that as a series of discrete and uh, irreducible volumetric entities. That stark exposure of these volumes uh, is, of course, going to have enormous consequences for the surroundings. Uh, it is a presence that acts most powerfully upon not only adjacent buildings, but also upon the immediate adjacent territory. And often, as in the Aerospace Museum, it can be seen partially from afar. It becomes an element, literally, of the landscape uh, or of the cityscape, something which almost cries out for that great escutcheon, for that single sign that could unify in itself uh, the signal, uh, signaling function for the building and its purpose, as well as stand apart from that building in such a fashion as to be clearly its sign and not its identity and not necessarily its contents. And here this escutcheon-like function is, of course, uh, played by the jet plane uh, that is deliberately set uh, on the building, cantilevered from it in such a fashion as if it were just in some vertiginous loop uh, uh, crashing past the structure itself. In that sense, it brings together with the building uh, an element that is altogether of another dramatic nature and of another origin. It truly turns, if proof were needed, this building, even this one, the Aerospace Museum, into a kind of dramatic stage set made of the movable parts that we know from gantries and rocket assemblies and, uh, and, and industrial uh, uh, production halls. Uh, the, the shapes seem the last remnants, perhaps remaindered remnants, of the great original industrial uh, imagery uh, where the definition of height, width, depth, aperture of doors and so forth seem entirely the result of the machinery used in the product, moved out of them, and so forth. Uh, but uh, now that appearance of the plane is going to tell the story. And here again, I cannot think of a better uh, direct connection than that to, again, Laurie Anderson's uh, performance cycle uh, called The United States, where in an absolutely haunting silent sequence, a plane changing its color is passing again and again in front of the Washington Monument in what seems an extraordinary uh, uh, winter scene, a sort of a sort of snow, massive, slow, massive snowfall uh, that seems to engulf Washington and Pitt for once, the symbol of national unity in all its pristine uh, stereometry against the curiously awkward, historically uh, historically determined shape of a plane that we don't quite know uh, what it is or does, except that it seems to go through its passage with inalterable regularity and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, in inalterability. I talked about Gary's interest in creating stages creating settings within which events occur, stories are enacted, institutions are defined. 
And I think it's very important to realize that schools, museums, other cultural institutions are, of course, in many ways, the real and ideological training grounds where our perf life performance is influenced and conditioned, where we learn our cues, where we pace ourselves, and where, indeed, uh, uh, the cultural life itself is seemingly coinciding with the only stage upon which that life can be quite enacted the way it can only, perhaps, in a museum or in a theater or on a campus. There are highly privileged, unique and specialized settings, settings which therefore have something somewhat stagey about them almost all the time, except that in Gary's case, I think that staginess is m turned increasingly into the determined, architec determined architectural and deliberate architectural quality. And it, I was reminded of it when I saw, as you will see when the show arrives here, in those set pieces that almost like empty stage sets appear, several of them, in the exhibition. They can be entered. They have a skin which is very distinctive. Uh, covered in different metals, I in differently treated woods, and so forth. They quite clearly show a taut outer skin and therefore an almost archaic uh, volumetric uh, presence and power. At the same time, they are thinly rationalized as booths and, and, and cubicles within which different segments of the work are exhibited. So that here, in a certain sense, Gary is for the exhibition uniting these two elements which I have previously set apart. But in his desire to abstract these elements, to bring them to their quintessential uh, presence, he is again following the path laid out by a great deal of research that was done and a great deal of experimentation that was accomplished in the early 20th century at Hellerau, in Tessino, in the school with Dalkros and elsewhere. And here is, of course, Adolf Apia again, one of many of the projects for rhythmic spaces of 99 on the right-hand side. <coughs> now, this quality of the stage, of course, allows him, allows Gary, in more recent projects, to, uh, in fact, create, even on the scale of a landscape, on the scale of an entire site, uh, a sense of individually placed volumes which allow you to uh, play three different family dramas, as it were, on three different sides of the complex. There are some which are truly mysterious, intriguing, even somewhat sinister, and others which have a kind of placid and agreeable and familiar side to them. And by reducing every component and exposing that component, often stripped down to the very element of a room um, a, on the site, he is then turning the whole task of composition and of integration of architectural volumes into a very different game from what it was before. A, a game which is now essentially predicated upon the manipulation of these distinctive volumetric bodies. And in that, he joins, perhaps by an extraordinarily indirect path, uh, a research that is contemporaneously carried on by such uh, architects as Aldo Rossi, with a page from his Libro Azzurro, where you can see uh, architecture similarly almost symbolically represented as a still life art, an art of another theatrical reduction, namely that of the miniature stage. Uh, upon which, uh, toy-like, the individual components are now subject to an endless game of rearrangement under the seemingly immovable hands of a time that has, arrest, has been arrested and that now awaits simply reenactment of familiar plots in unfamiliar places. This architecture, then, of Gary's, as well in this particular connection of Rossi's is an architecture totally uh, in contrast to that, let's say, of um, Michael Graves. And Michael Graves, who wants to set the stage, and indeed he does, by, of course, uh, inserting into the foreground uh, poetic transpositions of familiar works of art, 
but then is of course not content to only provide the set for events that he does not control. But indeed, he wants the building to be the story at the same time. He wants his buildings to strap their stuff. He wants uh, the buildings to uh, be both the stage and the story, in a sense like the American manager in Picasso's parade costume on the right-hand side. This is an architecture then that in a sense reduces itself to the image of its own powers rather than to trust the power of architecture to stand there, perhaps incomplete and fragmentary, in order to provide a setting, a setting that will be occupied, utilized, interpreted and made meaningful in many different and in many unanticipated ways, in ways which also extend beyond the setting, beyond the immediate surroundings, and allow the building in a completely unmonumental fashion to become a landmark, as does even at night the Cabrillo Marine Museum, which you have on the right hand side, 1979, in San Pedro. And it's that night view which makes me think again of a kind of large um, theatrical art of um, improvisational stages as those created in Iran, uh, in Shiraz, uh, uh, this of course before fundamentalism, uh, on the left hand side by Robert Wilson. Uh, that is to say, we find in this work uh, so closely and so capably oriented on the theatrical possibilities and potential uh, of architecture, we find that work to be a continuous recombination, a reinvention of what makes for familiar but at the same time distanced uh, sites and places, uh, distanced so that we can have a different experience of them distanced also in many ways from the cliché, the predictable, the hurriedly historically finished in favor of an architecture which shows itself unabashedly as a production, not only as a produ product of construction, but as a production uh, in terms that employ all of our means from the fast flash communication to the torn memory of something, to the uh, carefully staged theatrical production. Uh, in other words, it's not just the constructivist terms of production, which are invoked as a kind of historical origin in some sense, but beyond that, it is an architecture that reveals itself in its own making and reveals thereby the modes and implications of production uh, in, our, in our age. It is indeed produced in many ways under circumstances, and it is surely experienced under circumstances which have a certain overt theatricality about them. Thank you. Okay, anybody would like some questions, please. It's uh, oh.
Okay, there is a reception in room A, please.